recording. Okay, so let's let's start. So, hello everyone. Welcome to episode thirteen of uh, Warsaw AI. Uh, it's the first uh, uh, meetup webinar uh, in the new academic year, uh, and uh, this event will be focused on uh, natural language processing, and will host three uh, great speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Marek Bardoński. Uh, he will tell us about the practical approach to measuring and using the prediction uncertainty of a natural language processing system. Uh, then Paweł Budzianowski will tell about uh, adapting language models for conver conversational tasks. And finally, uh, Jared Forek will give a talk about language uh, models that write code. Uh, so uh, before we start, uh, I would also uh like to ask uh, a question regarding the next event so we'll also ask this question at the end and we'll send you uh, a survey uh, after this meetup to ask you uh, for your opinion and feedback uh, whether the next uh, episode should be online or stationary or maybe in a hybrid form uh, because even for this uh, event we're considering what might be the best uh, option uh, so yeah we are very curious what's what's your opinion and uh, we'll be happy to uh, consider our uh, options. Uh, so I think that we can start now. So Mark, if you are ready, uh, I will just stop sharing my slides. So the Zoom is yours. And you right. can start sharing your screen. Hope it works. It still works. Mm -hmm. uh, it should work. It's a bit tricky. OK, you can see your screen now. Right, so uh, hello everyone, one more time. Uh, thank you for joining. And uh, today, uh, today's talk, um, my talk will be about Royal Models. So Royal Models, uh, it's a framework. Uh, so it's not anything that is, I would say, a new algorithm or maybe anything that is very um, innovative. But it's a framework that I use with my clients and that I've been using for the past few years. Uh, and still, whenever I work with any team, um, then typically people don't people don't use it or forget about it. So I hope that will be helpful for you to understand the idea of measuring and using the identity. And also, it will give you um, it will motivate you sometimes to consider um a model that doesn't have like a full uh, full uh, it's not fully accurate it's to be still useful and still uh can produce some value for you for your firm or for your case um and let's start with the challenge that uh typically uh people can have when working on machine learning models so oh sorry So the first problem is that, as I said, many times when we work hard on creating a machine learning model, especially when I, for example, promise to my client to achieve, let's say, 95% of accuracy, and my model is achieving 93% of accuracy. Uh, and it's a moment when we feel like, okay, so all this work will be wasted because, let's say, this uh, that this um, level of accuracy may not be enough for uh, the task that you want to solve. And this is especially important for uh, predictions, uh, healthcare-related predictions. For example, if we predict if someone have a cancer with 93%, that's many times uh, not helpful at all. Uh, but then um, we still feel like this insights from the machine learning can give us something, especially something for some specific cases. But then the question is how to properly use it, how to integrate it. The other problem is that um, typical machine learning models, they have a big problem when they see an auto of distribution input. And for example, if you have a model that classifies um, cuts, cuts from dogs. So it have two classes, either it's a cat or it's a dog. And then we show uh, an elephant to the model. Uh, the prediction could be totally random. So it could either pre predict it's like 100% cut, cut or 100% dog. 
and that's a problem because then um, it's not fully reliable and we cannot detect this type of problems. Um, and the model still can be 100% confident that it's a, let's say, dog. <laughs> So that's uh, that's in many cases problem. Another problem is that uh, with the typical scenario, there is no clear cooperation between AI and human. So if we see that the model is not truly performing uh, enough, then we just don't use it. And we go to another problem or for example, problem in the organization, instead of thinking how we can actually make this uh, model that may not be fully perfect, to work to at least offload some of the work from the human, which of course many times can be a very, uh, very important and very uh, significant, significant cost saving for many tasks. So to overcome those challenges, um, the framework that I typically use, it's called like Royal Models Framework, is a framework that can get a standard model and nobilitate it to become a Royal Model. And what does it mean that it's a royal model? It means that uh, it can achieve any level of accuracy, but of course, sacrificing the efficacy. So for example, it can provide 99% accurate predictions in only half of the cases. And the other half have to be manual uh, process by a human, but it not only can, uh, but it can select those uh, half cases. So you can actually say, uh, on which inputs it can um, make a prediction of high accuracy and on which inputs it cannot. Uh, the other um, characteristic is that typically they are much more computationally intensive and that's connected with uh, the process of uh, measuring the r entity. It doesn't have to be this case, uh, but if you want to have a very high quality prediction of the r entity, then typically you want to use variational dropout and uh, that's actually requires us to run the inference 10 times instead of just running it once. But in many cases, especially with in the predictive analytics uh, cases, it's not that costly, but sometimes it is. And of course, there's also, there are also many uh, potential uh, solutions how we can overcome this problem. Uh, for example, by isolation, the last layer, and then just uh, performing 10 times the inference of the last layer. Uh, but in the practical cases, they are typically more complex. Uh, so not that many people uh, even have a problem with that. But that's, typical, they, that's the typical characteristic. Uh, another ability that is coming straight from the r estimation is the ability to reject poor quality input. Uh, so we can detect elephants and um, say that we are not going to process them at all. Uh, the other ability is to work with humans. Uh, so human actually deal with the poor, poor input or the input that is less common and maybe slightly more problematic for the model. Um, and as well, like uh, also coming straight from the, uh, to the applied prediction, uh, prediction as estimation, we can also pass it uh, as a, one of the outputs of the model. What models can be nobilitated? So in an easy way, uh, in a model that is based on neural networks, um, deep, deep neural networks um, can be very easily uh, altered just by adding a dropout layer that I will talk in details later on. Uh, but if the model is not based on uh, neural networks, we also have uh, a few options that we can use. For example, we can, uh, measure the conformity of the input with the distribution. But in this case, um, the major problem that we have is that um, typically they are less, less uh, efficient. So this type of uh, R-sentity estimation not always uh, is able to provide us with uh, good, uh, with strong enough insights so we can automate a lot of work. Maybe we can just automate some of the work. <clears throat> and now the question, the final question, how we can actually nobility the model. Uh, so there are three steps that we can take to turn any model into a novel model. Uh, uh, the step one is to add the r entity metric to the predictions. Um, so for example, I'll also talk about it later, but we can use the variational uh, inference, but also there are other ways. Um, 
Step two is to calibrate the R sensitivity to the desired accuracy. So when we already know what's the accuracy on each input, uh, then we can find the thresholds that will help us to um, understand what would be the expected accuracy when we process input like the, like the one that we are processing at the moment. And step three is very also very important, um, not to forget about it, is to implement control sample during inference. So why is this models uh, are able to predict um, <clears throat> how uh, certain they are uh, based on the training and validation data sets. Uh, in real life scenarios, we are we may have a situation when the input will completely drift in a completely different area. And then to prevent us um, from that happening, we can implement a control sample system that uh, some percentage of the inputs will be double verified by the AI and a human in a way that we will we can again estimate what is the again the expected accuracy for the predictions and as long as it's uh, within the specific threshold then we can say it's fine if it will go outside of this uh, threshold that means that something happened to the distribution of the input data and we have to take a closer look before we actually let those predictions to move for like to move forward to, in the pipeline. Um, and now about the R sensitivity metrics, there were uh, multiple great talks uh, on Warsaw AI. Even the last episode uh, was about uh, there was a talk about the con conformal predictions. So I can just uh, mention that there are four typical methods. Method number one is the most recommended for in practice for practical perspective because it's the easiest one. It's a variational inference. Uh, about this one, I will talk in details in the next slide. There is also another method, which uh, typically is the most powerful, but also is it's a very rare, it's very rare. Uh, not that many people know how to do it and not that many people have experience with that and it requires using completely different frameworks, but probably the most powerful, the most effective uh, method is to use Bayesian, Bayesian neural networks. Uh, there are also two methods that can be used. Uh, method number three is conformal predictions. So it's actually trying to assess uh, based on the input properties how likely it is that is uh, driven from the, the distribution of the training data set that was used to train the model. And the method four is uh, very similar but slightly different in the principle is the anomaly detection. So uh, it's, uh, for example, by using an autoencoder uh, that will try to estimate the, uh, the reconstruction loss that can provide some indication about uh, is the input actually coming from the distribution that the model were trained on. But it also is case specific. It doesn't work in all kind of, with all type of data. So uh, this choice is typically uh, open for, and with every problem, we need to select the best method. Um, regarding variational inference, maybe I will just uh, make a quick um, quick note. I, I don't, I'm not sure that was uh, presented on the previous talks. Variational inference is an inference repeated multiple times, usually 10 times, with a dropout, dropout enabled uh, during inference to collect the prediction variance over the course of those 10 runs. And then like, just like trying to very quickly uh, visualize it. If we make um, a neural network that can classify uh, cats and dogs and doesn't know anything about elephants, uh, typically what would happen is that if we make a small distortion to the, to the neural network, then in if it says a cat or a dog, the prediction will be stable. But then if it sees an elephant, the prediction will be um, like uh, rapidly changing and then it will be completely different from each other. And the variance between those predictions, the score will be much higher than the variance if uh, we want to predict on there's something that we know. So that this idea is actually, um, so using this type of propteria of the neural network is called variational inference. Um, and does the typical uh, way how you can actually obtain the R sensitivity metric. There's a lot of great resources about this topic. So if you're curious exactly how to implement it or see some code samples, uh, if you just insert this, this phrase in Google, you, you, will say, you will find 
some great tutorials. Uh, then um, the next step probably that is uh, more complex is the calibration. So if you want to use the model in a way that it will know uh, when, what accuracy it will process uh, each input with, uh, what we typically need to do is to create, a, to find the threshold for each prediction predicted class. And this threshold uh, should be based both on the class that the model think that this input will belong to. So for example, for cats and dogs separately, but also based on the r t threshold that will uh, be probably slightly different for, for each class. So for some classes, uh, the, mo the model can be less confident in the prediction and still have a very high accuracy. And with some classes, the confidence may be much lower, but because of different, uh, different reasons, for example, about, about uh, for example, because this class is very uh, distinct from all other classes, um, we can have a lower threshold and still achieve the same level of accuracy. Um, and then the, I will show you the pseudo code. So of course, we, there are multiple ways how we can do it uh, in, in a more scientific way using complex math. But I'm a practical guy, so <laughs> I will tell you what to do in the simplest way. And that's also, also a way that has been proven on multiple projects uh, that are working well on production. Uh, so the pseudocode is the, the following. So first of all, we generate predictions for a validation set, um, as usually. But then for we iterate over different uh, thresholds, possible thresholds. Uh, typically from 0, 0, 0,01 to 99. Of course, those thresholds can be normalized in a different way, or maybe you want to have a more granular thresholds, but that's typically what works. And then for each class that we can predict on, so in our toy example, cats and dogs, uh, we want to, and for each threshold, we want to calculate the total accuracy on validation set of inputs for which the model prediction is C and with normalized, normalized probability over P. So that means that we want to just check if we set the threshold to P, if we will achieve the desired accuracy. Plus the safe margin, which depends on the size of the validation set. Of course, if we have a bigger validation set and more represented class, the safety margin, margin can be lower, but if we have underrepresented class, the safety margin should be higher. Again, there is a complex mark that could be used to, that, to, uh, to exactly say uh, with certain p-value confidence uh, what the safe margin should be. Uh, but then that's probably be out of the scope for today. Um, but then of course, like uh, in the practical scenario, we can just set something that seems reasonable and it should be reasonable. Um, and after we iterate our all of the classes, uh, the model is ready. So uh, during the inference, uh, when we mm, when we work with this model, uh, we do the uh, predictions as usually. Um, and of course, we both predict the score and the uh, s t estimation. Uh, but then additional to, to the normal procedure, we also should hold out 5% as a control sample. This percentage depends on the batch size of our inference. So typically, if you have a, for example, batch size of 1000, if you hold 50 cases, on those 50 cases, you will have um, probably reasonable uh, confidence um, that uh, there is there's no deterioration in the expected accuracy. Again, this 5% is kind of arbitrary and you probably want to tune it to your own, uh, to your own use case in about the potential risk uh, with the incorrect prediction. But typically 5% works really well. Um, and then for each set of predictions, uh, we also want to separate those inputs for which the R entity per class is lower than the predicted, uh, that the um, calibrated in the previous phase threshold. Um, and those holdouts are passed to the human verification and after the human verification, we can also include those uh, those um, inputs in the validation set. And from time to time, and all in the training set, uh, like some in the training, some in the validation. And then from time to time, we can uh, retrain and recalibrate the model 
So this way we can actually improve both the accuracy and also the efficiency. Uh, but the control sam sample, of course, have also a very important property that if we detect that on the control sample, there is a much uh, higher divergence between of the accuracy between the algorithm decision and the human decision, if there is like a very high level of mismatch, much higher than we expect it to be, uh, that's the moment when probably we should investigate uh, and uh, stop process, stop using the, the algorithm for the moment and investigate it, uh, perform some additional tests and understand what's the reason. Sometimes the reason may be because of the drift in the data. For example, uh, the data may, may start to come from completely different distribution, but that's also like kind of like a control sample that can prevent us uh, before this type of unexpected situations. Um, so I think that's about it. And then it's time for questions. I'm very curious about your questions. Hey, thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, there's already one question on our chat. Does the method apply to regression problems or is it then needed to use other uncertainty estimation methods? So with regression problems, uh, from my knowledge, yes, yes, you can also just measure what's the variance of the regression score that is uh, an output of the model. But I personally never, never did on the regression problem. So mm -hmm. uh, from my understanding, it should be, I don't see any reason why it should not be able, we should not be able to use it. Okay. So you just didn't have any such cases, right? To, to just apply it. Actually, I, yeah, I never, I never, I never tried it. Um, mm -hmm. Then I don't see any reason why it should not work. Maybe you can try it yourself and let us know. All right, good. Um, in which areas did you apply these methods? Mm -hmm. From coming. So, yeah, so I typically work with those methods uh, with the financial industry for my financial clients. When we were working on uh, making predictions, for example, of relevance of the article, uh, or for example, want to make a prediction about um, some potential like um, trading related actions, so, so trading signals. So for, for those trading signals, some of them were verified by human and some of them can, could be processed by the AI system. Um, and also I, I, I use it in the healthcare as well. Mm -hmm. so for example, for the, for the uh, cancer screening, all right, great. Uh, do we have any more questions? In prediction mode, you said to make inference as usually. Uh, does it mean one prediction or in variational way? In variation, uh, variational way. In so variation. uh, we have to and I always use the variational way so we can obtain the R sanity score that could be later on used uh, to separate those, uh, those inputs that will be processed automatically from those inputs that will be sent for uh, for the manual verification. So it have to be used also during the inference time, unfortunately. Okay. If there is a comment from Alexander, that it's a great presentation. Uh, and another question from Camille, isn't it too slow for financial applications or involving too much human labor? Uh, that's a good question. So not, because uh, before AI, those, uh, those predictions were made by human. So the general idea is that we take a problem that is already solved by a human in a manual way, and then we can uh, resolve 50% of this problem by an automat. So still it's not like a perfect solution, but it's giving us 50% cost efficiency. So for example, if the client already hire, let's say 10 data analysts, doing this type of uh, predictions, then you can just hire five. So that's a huge saving for the client. It's not like a rocket science. It doesn't like, like transform his business, but in some cases it can actually make a huge impact, especially if it's a very competitive business uh, where businesses are competing on a tight margin and being just 5% or 10% or 15% more efficient uh, can means uh, a lot for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Uh, would you see this method working with non neural network models like 
SVMs, for example. Uh, I guess we, we could try doing variational inference with them. This is a question yes. from Alexander. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So by design, it's not, uh, I mean, by design, we potentially could implement it in some way. And as I said earlier, we can, for example, use the conformity metrics, or we can, for example, use the reconstruction loss as the R entity estimation metric, because uh, the more input is, uh, I would say, strange, or it's out of the distribution, the less likely it is that the model you provide worse prediction on that on that input. But the problem is that with that type of approach, uh, the R entity estimation is typically much weaker. So it's not as, I would say, strong, the signal, uh, as with uh, variational inference, or for example, with Bayesian neural networks. So for that cases, of course, there are multiple ways how we can solve it. For example, we can create a separate model that will just try to estimate this, uh, this um, percent entity and it's calibrated on a validation set or maybe like, a, like one of the additional data set that is um, curved out from the training data set just for uh, training the R entity estimation. But it's actually a much more complex topic. So that's really yes, we can use it, but it may require much more modifications and um, slightly more creativity than with the typical scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you compare this method with uh, Bayesian neural networks? So actually that's not a competitive competition or it's not a um, it's not anything else that just using the same uh, approach. Uh, as actually, as I said in the part, in the one of the slides, we can actually use Bayesian neural networks. The major um, idea is to use the protocol with the control sample and with the calibration, which of course can be used uh, also with Bayesian neural networks. So um, Bayesian neural networks is one of the ways how we can estimate the RCT in a very, very, very precise way. Uh, but this framework can be used independent on the way how you estimate the R entity. So I would say that you can use this method with Bayesian neural networks and probably that will work even better. But of course, it's very rare for people to use Bayesian neural networks, at least at the moment. Hopefully that will change in the future. So from the practical perspective, typically what I see in practice is to use, um, just to use variational inference. Oh, there are some papers, uh, but I think there's there's a lot of papers that could be explored. Uh, mm -hmm. I think um, I would have to take a look, but if you are if you will be curious after the presentation, feel free to email me and I will do the homework okay. and send you some of them. Uh, okay, Ma Marek, uh, if you if you have time, maybe you can also uh, try to look uh, for these papers uh, during course of NAI and then just paste them here on our channel. Yeah, that's uh, also yeah. good. Idea. Okay. Okay. So this was the last question because uh, now we should move on to the next uh, speaker. So Marek, thank you very much once again. It was really a great presentation. And thank also the, the Q&A Q session was uh, fantastic. Many interesting questions and uh, great answers. So thanks, Marek. Uh, and now uh, the next speaker, Pavel Budzianowski, adapting language models for conver conversational tasks. So. Uh, Pavel, welcome. If you're ready, the Zoom is yours. Cool. Can you hear me? Everyone? Yes, we can. Yes, yes, we can hear awesome. you now. I hope you can see my screen also. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Cool. So, hi, I'm Pavel. Um, I'm coming from Poly, uh, Poly AI, where I lead a machine learning team. Uh, and today I'm, um, I'm planning to talk to you about some um, adaptation of language models and conversational tasks. I'm super excited about it because that's kind of a, a new array of, of models that we are, uh, we are start product, productizing right now in Poly AI. And uh, it's been a little bit of a, a huge change for us and it's way simpler setup than we used to have before. A little bit background about myself. Um, I did maths at, uh, in Poznan um, at Adam Mickiewicz University and then PhD in dialogue system uh, in Cambridge. And um, in Poly AI, uh, we work on, um, on automating voice agents for customer services uh, and, and call centers in a variety of different 
domains. Um, we primarily are looking for voice. There's a lot of chatbots we probably use and they do not work as well. We are going for even more uh, harder problem, which is voice. However, um, it could end up in really nice interactions. Uh, let me just play you uh, what happens when two API bots talk to each other. This is Google Duplex calling Polyi Hospitality We have uh, now service. reopened. I'm a digital host. I can make bookings or tell you what we're doing to keep our guests safe. How can I help? Here, Google was, I guess, a little bit uh, frightened that the, the bot answered. I can't were, quite hear you. Silent. I can make bookings and answer questions. How can I help? Hello? Hello, how can I help? Hey, I'm calling from Google Maps. Given the current health situation, I want to update if you're open today. I'm an automated service, so this call is monitored and recorded for quality assurance. When do you open and close today? Today, we are open for breakfast between 6.30 and 10.30 a.m. We are open for lunch and dinner between 12. And so on. So as you can see, um, um, we are living already in the world where two, two different uh, automated bots are talking to each other and kind of a passing information, which is I found it really, really cool. Uh, of course, uh, there is a lot of things to do um, to improve that. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, about conversational AI uh, in general because it's composed of a variety of different subcomponents. We don't have time or will to talk about it, um, but I want to uh, focus today about uh, about natural language understanding module. Which is sits inside of the uh, of it, and you can think of it as a brain. And particularly, um, I just want to look at two very popular, um, kind of a naive naive approach to understanding that is heavily used in production based models. Um, both of these models are, is are into classification and slot labeling tasks. So, um, what is instant classification? And 99% of the conversation that are task oriented and a user is calling us with some predefined intent or uh, in a specific turn, um, it has it wants um, to do some uh, some stuff that could be translated to the intent space or it wants um, they want to do our system to do some specific thing and we translate it uh, to a different space of intents. As you can see in both of these examples, uh, in, in one turn, there could be a variety of different intents uh, fired up. Um, which leads to the multi-label um, uh, multi intent classification, which is another, uh, another uh, layer, layer of problematic um, of our problems. So um, we are living in 2021 in the, in the world of, of pre-trained large uh, language models. And for our needs, um, however, we were building these big sentence encoders um, internally. For that, we built a, a huge data set compared of around 600 million response selection par, uh, pairs based on Reddit data set, um, which is a fantastic source of, of, of conversational interactions. Why we do that? Um, because we want to specialize um, in, in conversational tasks that is sometimes well, it's hard to evaluate, first of all, and sometimes most of the, uh, um, especially research academia is, uh, is, is focusing on, on, on blue um, sort of task, which is not directly um, uh, related in some, in some cases. So in this, uh, in this case, given the context, um, we are pre-training our model with a simple, really simple task where given, let's say, 100 random answers and the, the right one, we just have to pick the right answer. Because uh, it's specialized, um, uh, we can really optimize for uh, speed and compactful uh, size. Uh, we can squash it down, which is really helpful for, uh, for product, uh, product needs. Um, back in the early BERT uh, class models, um, we were obtaining superior performance being 10 times um, smaller and 10 times faster. It's super important because at the end of the day, um, for when we are serving a request for clients, um, every project for every client um, needs to have a specialized intent classifier. So in our case, it's just a simple MLP head um, on top of this um, transformer-based uh, pre-trained encoder. We just need to fine tune it, takes a couple of minutes and stores, uh, and it's, it takes really um, a small sp uh, space in the storage. Now, of course, a lot of has happened since 2018 and, and BERT was released when we were sort of thinking about our models. Roberta is coming in and, and uh, a lot of uh, progress in distillation. A lot of has pro progress has also happened in terms of classification approach. The world is moving into similar, similarity-based um, classification. We started playing around with that, where we're trying to map uh, the space of intents into, uh, into the space where uh, similar kind of a atomic intents are grouped together. 
Um, and, and we played around with that with a variety of different losses, nothing new here. Um, however, we already observed the boost, um, especially big ones um, for, for cases that we care uh, the most about. Here's the um, accuracy for um, one of the test bets we have internally, where for 10 examples per intent, um, we are uh, improving quite a bit, um, at least in our views. Um, against Convert Roberta, um, have, have a look here that actually um, our internal sensor encoders is, is still a kind of a competing on per with R R Roberta. Um, at this point, we didn't stop, but we ask ourselves if Convert is, um, you know, is, is producing such a good result, why not to combine uh, the similarity based um, approach of classification with the pre training, um, which, is the, which is the main topic? Um, with, which, with adapting of language models, which is the main topic of this presentation. So we ask Roberta to also um, start with the stage one, where we are kind of a, um, do conversational fine tuning on Reddit data. Again, response selection task um, pre trained Back then, um, we had 600 million pairs. It turns out that uh, even with 1% of this data, that is then is followed with um, uh, similarity-based classification and a, a naive, really simple uh, nearest neighbor uh, choose of the right intents from uh, from the pool of the classes, we can uh, further uh, further uh, boost the results, which which is uh, which is right now our current state of the art. Um, and then we were also uh, luckily to also publish the paper about that. Uh, but more importantly, um, um, it clearly shows that we can take off the shelf. We kind of a change the imperative because we can take off the shelf. Um, big sensors encoders and applied um, um, conversational tuning before the, the final task in domain. So that's how we covered uh, intent classification. Um, and in, um, what I also, it's, it's super great here is that thanks to this tuning to the conversational, we clearly started getting a benefits of, of, of getting a better represent representational space. Um, for our conversational task. And you can clearly see that how with each of the phase, we are started grouping the intents more and more, um, uh, better and better, um, which is which helps a lot uh, when it comes to so simple tasks where uh, we're just nearest neighbor um, um, uh, approach is needed, especially for inference speed. Um, uh, a, a, a different uh, problem that I mentioned in the beginning was the slot labeling. Um, again, in 99% of the conversation, um, during the conversation, the, the model has to extract important um, entities from, from the user um, uh, in the text and then keep it in the state across the dialogue to then query API or uh, you know, mention it back to the user. In this example, um, right, there's like date uh, we're flying in at the airport or a customer number that will be needed. Um, in, in, in general, it's called um, a name entity recognizer, a problem well known. However, in the conversational context, it also spans across terms, which um, then is referred in the, in the conversational domain as a um, dialogue state tracking problem. So again, um, kind of a repeating the story, we came up with the closest style pair um, uh, pre-training uh, problem with 1.2 uh, billion um, pairs of, of template and input sentence where we were um, uh, blanking out uh, a, a, a span that, uh, that was of, of interest and then giving a, another example of input sentence where the model was, uh, was asked to also get the span right, which is exactly the same, uh, but then on the left side, you have the, you have the blanked one. Again, because it's, it's, it's on, based on conversational data sets, it's specifically per training for, for the task um, that we care about the most, not the glue task or any other ones. Um, again, we can really uh, squeeze down the, 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 the size of transformers to a couple of layers. Um, again, fast inference speed. And um, as with convert, so the results compared to early bird class models. Um, and then um, with playing around with the architectures, we, we were allowed to, um, we, 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 we found a way to um, efficiently fine tune for, for, for specific slots for specific clients, um, and which serve in, the, in production. Now, a lot of progress again, also in QA domain, um, re related with the, with the more powerful sentence encoders. Um, in QA task, right, given the excerpt of the task um, and the question, um, we, we, then the model is asked to get the right passage from the text. Um, Amazon folks proposed the idea of, of transforming slot labeling um, to the QA problem. And in this example, as you can see, given, let's say, the three slots of, of interest for us, 
um, we just literally ask the model um, what day that you're flying in, where you're flying from or where to, and then the model is, um, is, is extracting the right spans. So really straightforward um, uh, approach of, uh, um, that is going to be beneficial. Why it's going to be beneficial? Because we can take off the shelf census encoder. Um, there is more and more uh, squad data sets um, on the market. Well, similar to squad. In this uh, particular example, squad was used, the most popular one, I guess, um, the, the most well known and well created. Um, again, as with um, intent classification, we were doing a, a domain tuning, which is um, a squad based um, QA learning for Roberta. And then we are transforming the in house data for this particular domain, and we are keep fine tuning on the set. Now, um, initial approaches were not um, taking into account the problem of, of ambiguity that um, doesn't happen often in the chat uh, chat based conversation, but it does happen does happen often in the in the uh, in the case of voice conversation where people are uh, really are not uh, into talking a lot, especially because they don't believe that um, that the voice agents are smart enough. So in this case, right lacks uh, doesn't tell us much because it could be like flying to or flying from airport. Back in, uh, in, in in previous our models, we had to come up with some sort of internal architecture that was um, faced with a transformer um, uh, with the encoder to incorporate for the context. Here, um, um, we, we played a lot, a lot with different architectures and different setup. Turns out, really naive um, uh, way of putting a context, simplified context, uh, as a part of the question that uh, solves most of our uh, solves of our most of our case uh, problems and cases. Um, so um, that was really um, it's really helpful for uh, for especially data annotation and maintenance um, in the long future. Um, with um, here again, the story is kind of the same to the to the intent classification. Um, QA based slot labeling um, uh, gives a huge improvements on both of the graphs. You can see F1 across um, two domains of interest uh, with a couple of slots in the per domain. Um, this is F1 scores. And what is super important here is that you know at the end of the day, uh, as you can see, both of them reach um, the same performance in the full data setup. Um, but in reality, in the production um, uh, production systems, most of our clients, for example, give us ten sentences or uh, ten examples of slots per project, and and then most of the time we don't have time to produce more um, data. So a huge improvements in um, in the especially in the beginning um, in the small um, uh, data setups is really helpful for us um, to 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 be good, especially at the start. Somebody's drawing some stuff on my slides. So I'm not sure if that's the question or um somebody just making fun of my excel graph um yeah um so we with this we started thinking about um mm, uh, adding more data uh, right um after squad 2018 um, a lot of new things is being produced uh, more and more actually every day um so we made uh we started experimenting with um adding more data straight for a delay and in this case as you can see um Squat uh, uh, tuning um, uh, gives us um, uh, good performance on, um, let's say, 64% of uh, 64 examples for a particular um, slot. Uh, adding more data and with better quality, which is MRQA, and increase the performance even better. Uh, Interestingly, um, if you look at the PAQ um, column, um, it's a data set, um, prob probably asked question, data set created recently by Facebook, which was artificially generated, uh, where questions, answers, and, and passages were, uh, were uh, artificially um, chosen by the models. Even there, um, with uh, 64 more examples, at least in this domain, uh, we start similar. We start seeing similar performance than squad. However, the huge difference that for squad you have around 150,000 examples, PAQ is around 60 millions. We only sc barely scratched the uh, uh, tuning uh, phase there, so there is um, still more to do. Uh, but already, it's, it's being really, um, really um, good results for us. So, um, why it's so slow? So these are the improvements, a straightforward actually idea. So adapting the language models um, to the to the task of need, or um, adding uh, a ta additional uh, tuning task uh, before um, going for uh, models of interest. Um, what is um, also important for us is that 
um, reality of the production um, world against the research world, uh, the stuff that you read in papers is not always straightforwardly um, applicable uh, to reality, to the real, real world, and that's not all, also emphasized. So looking at the time, I think I have a couple of more minutes, so I am gonna, also going to talk a little bit about that. So in terms of poly, you're living in a multi-tenant model service world where we have to um, handle customers' requests. And um, now, you know, given that we have really small space for uh, for uh, particular models for projects, um, so that gives us around right now five megabytes, and which translates to around one million parameters. You can do some, um, you know, um, uh, um, tricks with the uh, quantization, but it's still not going to help you much. And given the fact that, um, um, for example, Roberta has 300 million parameters, not even talking about uh, GPT-3 or um, uh, similar sorts of models, we are living in really constrained world. Um, and, and then inference time has to be also um, really fast. So um, we played a role a lot um, in recent times um, with fine tuning this new um, large census encoders. And I just want to share with you that, uh, you know, uh, we started seeing that adapters consecutively are winning and every time we start using it against every other approaches where you, you know, you, either you play with the uh, infrastructure, uh, with the architecture um, or, or, or fine tuning different components um, of, the, of the bits or adding a new layers. Um, and um, adapters um, uh, are really straightforward ideas where you, given a transformer layer, you're just adding a squash and squash out uh, feed forward networks, uh, two layers um, inside of the transformer. And, um, you know, you start, you, you're doing that in every transformer layer in your sentence encoder. Um, and, and, and that's basically the only thing that you're using during the fine tuning process for a specific, uh, specific domain. Um, recent actually uh, papers are also showing that you don't even have to you know, add this to all the layers, but just the top one. So um, thanks to that, um, we, were, we were allowed to uh, basically fine tune um, uh, either uh, slot label models or uh, intent classifier models um, with 1% of the data. Here is Roberta, so it's around 3 million parameters. It's still a little bit below, uh, above the um, product needs, but we're getting there. Um, and the final results are not matching fully the, um, the, the performance uh, when you fine tune the full model. But again, um, we are living in a world of 3 million parameters fine tuned versus 300 million. I don't have to tell you about the um, storage space, um, uh, speed of the fine tuning, and, and all the other sorts of problems that fine tuning a full model uh, brings um, to the table. Um, uh, so, so that's really, really cool news. Um, in terms of you know dis distilling the knowledge and, and 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 being applicable in the real world problems. All right, um, I think I rushed too much as always. Um, so so basically my. So, um, if anyone has any question, um, uh, let me know. Okay, uh, great, thank you, Pavel. Uh, we already have some questions on our chat. Uh, in fact, there are two questions. Um, have you explored uncertainty estimation? Uh, something similar to the topic mentioned in the previous presentation, detecting unknown intentions, and if yes, how you handle it. So let's, let's start from this question. Got it, got it. So um, we do not use any Bayesian neural networks. Um, I haven't seen anyone using that heavily in production, um, at least in our field. Um, however, we played around uh, a lot uh, with uh, similarity measures, which kind of a could be seen as a, you know, also a probability metric just symmetric um giving us uh, uh for, for example in the context uh, um, uh context response pair like how you know given the cosine distance between um the right answer and all the other ones we can see how big is the cosine metric and uh um however you know the the experience give us that neural networks always tend to overfit so you know uh it all boils down basically to having prediction from close to zero or close to one um, maybe that's also, you know, um, bad setup of us fine tuning and not putting right regularization or not going for, um, you know, Bayesian approach. Um, but um, in reality, um, I haven't, I haven't seen solid proofs that, you know, the, the, the estimates are really that good. So I guess the answer is no. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question. From my impression, uh, automated speech recognition for two different languages often doesn't work. Isn't it a problem for slots like geographical names in other languages so that you get not fully correct inputs from voice translated into text? 
Yeah. Um, so, so that's the world we are living in every day. Every day, I see these, these problems. SR, uh, in terms of especially voice conversation, which is 8K line, um, where the quality is even worse than um, uh, and in just recording it through the uh, laptop, really hits us hard. So we we, we do two things here. Uh, first, uh, we have um, uh, fine-tuned um, ASR models for specific um, turns where, for example, alphanumerical um, input is given. Um, on top of the general one, we, we, we run actually a couple of ASRS models. We are getting endless lists. And then on top of that, uh, we have uh, a second uh, um, approach where given the endless list, we're also running a, a, a multiple um, NLU inferences um, requests. And on top of that, um, for cases like, for example, names, um, where we're verifying the users, we are all going into the phoneme level space, which is way um, easier um, to work with than, um, than, the, uh, than the text um, base, because uh, in most of the ASR models are not working end to end, they have the language model that bias the, the phoneme level space. So we are kind of uh, going back to the real general space. Um, that's, that, and that's just really helpful. It boosts a lot of our problems. So that's like, uh, that's our two main things. But um, yeah, ASR is, is a pain, it's a big pain. Hey, great. Uh, there are two more questions. Uh, where do the memory, where does the memory limitation of five megabytes per client come from? Is oh yeah, so <laughs> that's a question. Yeah, that's a that's a question I'm asking my uh, the DevOps every day. But basically, like the, the the speed in our network, we do have customers from uh, different parts of um, uh, of the world. So even like optimizing for clusters in US or UK. Um, we do not store um, the models um, uh, all the time on the on the node that is, is is doing the requests. So we have to get it from the database. So um, the smaller the model, the faster we're gonna get it, uh, put it, um, uh, you know, instantiate instantiate the client and start running the inference. So that's where it's come from. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, uh, there's one, at least one more question uh, from Jakub. Do I understand correctly that in adapters, one fine tunes only these selected layers and then plugs them into the model for inference for a selected client? Yeah, exactly. So, so basically, let's say we, we take Roberta here. Um, for each of the layer, we are adding these two, uh, um, two uh, feed forward um, layers. Um, we, we, we fine tune um, all, only these layers. We put it aside for a specific domain or a specific project. And then we load it um, uh, to the to the to the big encoder. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last question from Alexander: Did I get it right that switching from uh, NER to QA paradigm for intent classification gave you significant benefits? So, great story. We're right now going into this world. Uh, where is this? So um, in this case, um, Amazon already folks already showed um, that QA also can be done in uh, for intent classification when you just ask like was increased intent um, ask in this question or whatever. The problem with this case is that we often face the, the domains where we have 300 intents, which means we would have to ask the model 300 times. Um, so that kind of, uh, um, you know, imposes the issues of, of concurrency uh, because doing them sequentially, is, of course, is too slow for, uh, for voice conversations. So um, we're not sure how to deal with this right now um, reliably. There's a follow-up question uh, from the last question we'll ask, but don't you have uh, the problem with people coming with intentions which are not known to the system? Oh yeah, so, so I guess that comes back to the uncertainty um, issues. I think I overfit to the Bayesian ideas and uncertainty in the weights versus the classic problem of um, out of the domain um, intents. Yes, uh, we do have this problem. Um, we are trying hard to come up with good ideas to deal with that. Um, there are a couple of ones we never published and we actually never got it through, I guess, um, uh, outside uh, of the company. Mm, it's hard um, and I'm, I, I'm, 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 I don't want to lie, like uh, it, it hits us hard. Um, so, so uh, yeah, it's, it's still a research progress. I can point you to a couple of papers in the last few years that are touching it a little bit. Um, but again, um, they are not, they're, they are not full solutions to that problem. But um, I'm happy to send it right after my talk. Okay, great, fantastic. So that was the last question that we're able to ask Pavel. So if there are more questions, you can uh, post them on our chat and maybe Pavel will be able to answer. But now we have to move on to the next uh, uh, talk, the last talk today. Uh, Jared Forek from OpenAI. 
uh, soldier, if you are ready, uh, let's try to share your slides. Uh, hello, everyone. Let me let me try and do that. Set up everything. Let's see if it works. Yep, you can see our slides now. Okay. Okay. Perfect. perfect. Yeah. Oh. Hello everyone, welcome, welcome, and many great thanks for, for everyone who decided to, to listen to this talk and spend a small part of their life uh, hearing uh, and listen, listening to my, my talk about language models that write code. This is a topic that I am personally very, very excited about and very interested in. I hope you will find also some, some interesting bits about, about that. Some of you may remember my talk from last year at the exact same venue when I was talking about the path from GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3. What, what, it, what, what does path mean for, like, for, for, for language models? What, 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 what is the progress there? How do we look at those models? And today I will be looking at a maybe slightly smaller and trained on a slightly smaller data set than GPT-3, but a cousin of GPT-3 that we call Codex. And I hope, it, at least in some aspects, it will be at least as interesting to you. And you know, even at OpenAI, we are not fully convinced that size is the only thing that matters. So, so I hope that you will, you, 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 you will find something interesting in that model for you. Mm -hmm. I'll try to des describe you this, this path to like to the codex models that we that we know and see today as, as, as a journey because this, this is the work that was started almost two years ago and went through went through multiple stages. Uh, first, the first moment of when we when, when the idea of like codex came up was literally after GPT-3 was, was released. If, you, if you've been around the Twitter sphere at that moment, you could have seen it exploding with people finding demos of GPT-3 doing, doing things with code. And this is, this is one of the reasons we at OpenAI are very interested in like, in like deploying those models and allowing people to access and, and use them. Because we can't re really even predict ourselves what, what they are good at, what they are capable of. So we are, we are we're very happy so that people discover what these models are capable of and what, what even people are interested in, in using them in. And that, that, that was a moment for us that we didn't even try in any way make GPT-3 work with code. There, 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 there wasn't any intent, it was just a random scrape of the, of the internet that this model was trained on. And people find it very cool to play with, very, very useful to do some, some demos and some preliminary work. So we are okay if there's an interest in that, if and, 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 we, and we get to that level without without really trying, what can we do if we try to make a good model that that program that, that writes code? And as, as 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 like a machine learning practitioner, there is like you know an, an entry-level book about like how do you how do you go in a new field and how do you how do you try things? And we basically like follow the steps from that book kind of kind of in a, in a very vanilla fashion throughout this project. So first part is you need to gather the data set for your model, then you need to train the model on that data set, and then you like poke this model, evaluate it to see what is it good at, what is it bad at, how does it, how does it behave and how does it perform. You build some demos to show other people how this model is doing, and then potentially you, you, you repeat and, and, and improve on that process going, going forward. But as we were feeling at least in our, in our sense going into a rather new area with that models, we, we, we took a relatively relatively greenfield approach. And getting any and a data set for that model was mostly possible due to the open source movement and, and the fact that programmers all around the world share their share the source code of their programs with other programmers for them for them to use it, for them to modify it, for them to for them to read it and learn from it. And like thanks to that, we have today like a pretty big repository of a code that is uh, that, that is available for for everyone and like there's there's single website in the in the internet github you probably everyone is, is aware of it where most of the code resides uh, where, where, where you can access it and, and and a lot of people it's even not, not not only accessible but particularly easy to access there are a lot of ways people people already have been analyzing this data in the past 
uh, there, there, there is like all of the GitHub data is available in Google, Google BigQuery for, uh, for analysis. There's a project called GitHub Torrent, which analyzes a lot of data from GitHub in various ways. And also like there's a public data set called the Pile, which was part of a GPT-3 replication by an outside team of OpenAI that also uses GitHub as part of their, their training data sets. So this data set is generally like publicly available for, for everyone to, uh, to use and, and access. Then there's the second part in the, in the, um, uh, in the machine learning uh, workbook is training the model. And here we didn't really, we didn't really have to do much. We already had like GPT-3 training set up ready because we trained GPT-3 on it. And we didn't really, we didn't really do anything different about that. We, we, we are on almost the same code, the same hyperparameters, everything. The only kind of difference that was there is that we already like the, the initial the ways that initialization were at random the weights that initialization were like gpt3 model weights at various sizes that uh, that we were training at and we aren't even sure that it helped it should it shouldn't be any worse than than, than starting from our own initialization it's we, we there are some signs that maybe it helps a bit in, with largest models, but there is there is a bit of a trade-off there with like what kind of pre-training size of your data set is, fine-tuning data set size is, et cetera. It's it certainly we, we don't think it make it make a terrible, terrible difference that that said that, but it's it certainly didn't hurt in any way. So we use we, we used all of the existing stuff without any literally any innovation and just just, just reuse that. So all of our all of our like work and where we think where, where, where we did any any like valuable contribution is like evaluating those models after after we gather the data set, which is which like anyone can do, you can put it on your hard drive. It's like a couple hundred gigabytes. So like it's it's, it's even relatively easy to download it. Uh, after like training it, which like already papers have been published on how to train big language models, and everyone everyone can can read them. Uh, our our contribution was like evaluating those models and seeing what they what they can do and cannot do after we did those those two initial initial steps and as you can see there is there's quite a long long list of people who in some way contributed to, to that effort. I want to come back to like uh, one the slide that I consider the most important from my previous presentation about the scaling loss from natural language models. If someone is still not familiar with them and is interested in like in large transformers language models, I, I still recommend to get, get familiar with that work. I think this is like probably the most like astonishing fact about those models and the most influential results to me about how do we approach those models and how do we think about those models? Because like those scaling laws almost work like physics, like set of simple rules that govern like a lot, much, much more complex objects. And like analyzing them using those simple rules is like, it's, it's suddenly becomes very straightforward and, 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 and almost like joyfully, Mm, joyfully regular. So, 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 just just to quickly to quickly recap the, the original scaling loss paper observed that there are very predictable relationships between like the model performance that, that you get at the end and the amount of like compute literal flops that you spend training this model, the size of the data set you've used training that model, and the number of parameters that that the model. That the model has, and of course, like with increasing each one of those factors, the model generally generally gets better. And unsurprisingly, after we train our models on code, uh, figure out the test loss on them, which is like the probability of predicting the next token in a in a data set, it's it, it's very nicely behaves as a perfect scaling law, which kind of like reassured us that we are doing something right, and our models. Our models are getting better and better, and the scaling is is, is predicted. So, in this kind of like slightly new setting, different uh, different modality than natural language, uh, that the, the scaling will still uh, still hold. Uh, but we're thinking: is it is like the question how well the models predict the next token in the data set? Is it the ultimate question we can we can ask ourselves? How good our models are? 
And for us, the answer was not really that when, when the models start writing code, there is a notion of like correctness of code, like the code uh, compared to like natural language, casual conversation, whatnot. Uh, the code is a much more formal construct. That's one thing it can be run. It has some semantics. And more of that, on top of that semantics, you can, you can like consider in, in, in certain settings, certain, certain pieces of code correct or incorrect, depending on your, on your requirements. And we wanted, to, we wanted to analyze when does the model write correct code? And when is that code correct to also the, the intent of a human? How can we ask the model to write some, some piece of code? And when will it re represent, when it will synthesize the correct program for that prompt? So we, we, we created a data self. We call, we, call, we call it human eval. And in a second, I will get why is it called human eval. But we, we wrote it in a way to kind of somehow mimic how that the dot strings look at, at, at the training data set at GitHub. And we we, we, we written in a doc string a prompt of something we would like the model to do. And then sampled from a, from a model as with, with regular auto regressive language model we can do number of a number of tokens until the model uh, told us that it that is finished with writing a particular function. And for each of those, those prompts, we have a set of hidden unit tests that the model doesn't see. Here you can see in this uh, in this doc string there are a few examples already presented to the model, but there is a much larger set of tests that test cases that the model never never sees. And we evaluate the correctness, uh, the correctness on those. That 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 allowed us to to like automatically evaluate if something a program synthesized by the model is 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 correct or not, given like our notion of correctness for a for a particular prompt. And the data set is called human eval because it was literally written by humans. These are, these are like 164 problems, and large part of it we've written ourselves from scratch. Uh, the, the problems we kind of wanted the models to solve, and the, the part of it was, was written by a, a professional programmers from from outside of OpenAI, and we, we really cared about the problems to be original. The problems that are nowhere in the training set because we wanted to avoid any kind of potential contamination with like the open source code there is, and the only real way how to how to assure that before we publish that data set, of course. Was literally like writing a data set ourselves to, to, to evaluate that model because on, on GitHub there's so much code. It, you, it is very hard to find something that has, that has no overlap with GitHub in a, in a, in a, guaranteed, in a guaranteed way. And there, there, there are a lot of problems. If anyone is, if anyone is interested, there is a repository. You can, you, you, you can check out this, uh, this data set. Some problems are easier, some problems are harder. This is one of the one of the somewhat more interesting ones because it, um, it it kind of you have to reverse a particular function and if you look very closely the the, the, the function that, that that like decodes the encoding function is in direct copy of what is above it needs to be slightly modified the modification is pretty small but there, there's required modification and model has to figure out how to modify the source code of the first function to be able to decode uh, decode the, the, the encoding. I think it's, it's 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 pretty clever that the models can do things things like that. Uh, and like you know, kind of kind of answer kind of surprisingly actually, but this is this is one of the moments where where, where you are in awe of the beauty of nature. It it does turn out that if you if you take a sequence of models of various model sizes and evaluate the accuracy, so maybe maybe it's a good moment to define what we consider accuracy on those tasks. And it is it is very simple in a way. We sample for each task out of human evals, so for each of like 164 problems, we sample 100 programs from from our our model. We we ask it please synthesize for me 100 programs. Then we check on, on, on all of the programs together, how many of those are correct, how many of those pass the unit tests versus how many don't pass the unit tests. And that's it, we get, we get some kind of percentage, some kind of number between zero and one, how many of, of the samples were passing. 
And then we plot that on a, on a, on a, on a, on a graph versus like the logarithm of the model size. And suddenly it, it turns out that the models like totally align in a perfectly straight line and their, their, their performance on the data set that we have written like before we trained on most models uh, that we've written kind of haphazardly without even like considering the difficulty of the problems. Some of them are easier, some of them are harder, but we didn't, we didn't calibrate the difficulty anyway. And on a kind of like a random data set written by ourselves that way, suddenly the, the behavior and the scaling of, of the models is totally predictable, totally regular. This is one of, one of those models moments when you see the nature and we're kind of like astonished by its, by its beauty and, 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 and regularity, which was, I'm, I'm, I'm perfect. I, I, I am personally like per, per proud of this, of this plot and this, the fact that, that things look as nice as they as they do without really really much much trying to make it look that way and so to to, to come back a bit to the to the human evils uh, i i decided to show here one more slide of a particular problem maybe it's because i like it because i've written it myself but uh, sometimes the, the problems get get a little bit a bit tricky the task in this particular problem is to uh, they're, 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 we, we provide a string to the model containing uh, some number of digits written as as as, as, as like in, in characters as, as words representing those digits, and we ask the model to sort those 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 digits in a string like according to to their value, which kind of requires the model to know a lot of things even outside of like how to write proper Python code, but also like what are the numbers, what are their values. So there's there, uh, we, we, we try to test the models on, on, on a lot of different different aspects. And there, there's one, uh, another particularly astonishing result that, we, that we've seen, which is that we, we, we have those, 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 those set of problems uh, and some of them are, are pretty complex. Some of them are relatively easy. We've seen that if we if we have only one sample, first we're solving the, the task, and we calculate the accuracy, which I've talked already before. We can take like even even an R max sample, and we very often do that, or like very low temperature to get like usually the best sample of the model. We 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 get to a particular particular accuracy. We are we are able to solve easily like thirty percent of those problems with like to a model of size of 12, 12 billion parameters. But there's a much more, uh, well, maybe not much more, but at least equally as interesting fact is that we if we allow the model to take a lot of samples for much harder tasks, tasks on the, on, on human evals that are in a, in, in a higher tiers of difficulty, there is like very high chance that at least one of those hundred samples is actually correct. And that fact is, is, is very deep because some of those problems are pretty hard. And so that, that the models are actually in some, in some weird way, much smarter than they appear initially because like it's, it's very hard to solve, you know, solve the problems like this by just randomly, you know, you know, writing writing random programs even even in a hundred in a hundred tries. You have to you have to know certain things, and the model it does seem it's it's they, they are not as well calibrated yet to like to to some of those problems know the answer straight away, but they are definitely smart enough that if they have a hundred tries, one of those hundred tries will be correct. It kind of like you know, you, 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 there, there is an, an ongoing and very valuable debate how much of it is, is, is any reasoning, how much of it is, is, is kind of thinking, but still like figuring out what in one of the hundred tries an answer for some pretty, um, pretty challenging uh, programming puzzle for a completely automated system is to me something very, very, very interesting and very, very, very valuable. So, so, so that is another another kind of insight we have about about those models. And like, if, if, very interestingly, at this at almost the same time where we where we, where we published our work, there were published two other other works about other teams. One was the the, the research team from Berkeley, 
of the research team from Google, kind of like doing almost almost the same the same evaluation procedure. They propose some kind of data set of some kind of programming puzzles. They evaluate some models on those on those puzzles. Here is a is a, is a, is a plot from from Google paper, which also also shows like pretty regular scaling behavior. If we increase the model size, how does the the performance of, of on solving programming problems uh, increase? And it also seems to be uh, seems to be pretty pretty regular. Mm. Uh, there is there, there there is another another like. Uh, fun fun fact that each one of those free papers, which I think they were they were written basically entirely independently, agree completely, is that how bad of a metric is blue score, and like this is this is the power that I see in like in like using models, uh, language models to synthesize programs, so we have very well defined metrics for co correctness, reasonably objective, and we can. We can then check how other how our other metrics how, how how good they were if we have like very objective metric of correctness, and each each one of the papers looked at that and they said no blue score is a very bad metric it doesn't doesn't necessarily correlate in any way with the correctness of programs and like you know there there, there is an open question because a lot of people in natural language analysis, especially machine translation, use blue metric for, for a lot of things like how good it actually is, how, how well it correlates with something that we want. But I am I, 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 I am personally, for practical reasons, very happy to work in a particular setting where, uh, where, where I have a metric that I, at least I feel in some way I can rely much more that it represents, uh, represents the true progress of the models and in some way uh, them better. Being meaningfully better, better programmers. Uh, yeah. So like, so, so so like coming back to a bit, a bit summarize why 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 I'd say why, why it's a good thing and a good good endeavor to do teaching models to program is that one 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 one, one thing. It's pretty clear that uh, programming is an economically valuable thing to do, and like. Tra training models to do that it means it's, it's it's something hard to do. It's something it's something that if we ever get the models to do, for us it will be it will be valuable. They will be helpful. They will be useful. And the other the other thing that we have the strong objective evaluation criteria, which is which is an excellent thing and it allows us to be very grounded and kind of we uh, allows us to know better what our models can do, what our models can do. We are allows us better to track progress. With, with 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 training those models and like arguably but i personally think that that uh, you know, models being able to like write com more complex and complex programs solve programming problems maybe one day hypothetically like you know participate in programming competitions this is something that, that correlates with, with with intelligence and, and, and you know, in some ways uh, we are we are after after intelligence and you know, if you think about humans and our our intelligence on a very 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 high level, like we didn't evolve to prog to write programs, right? We didn't evolve to like to to to, to calculate taxes. We didn't evolve to we didn't evolve to drive cars. We we evolved to be hunters and gatherers. We evolved to to collect food and and and, and, and eat animals and put plants and, and procreate. This is this is what our evolution directed us. But at some point, evolution figured out that giving us big brain, uh, like actually makes us better hunters and gatherers, and better at procreation. And in some way, it may be that if we train models to be good enough programmers, maybe they will start being like smart enough so that it also like transfers in some way to other tasks that, that require intelligence and smartness. It is pretty hypothetical, but but in some way could be could be plausible. Uh, so coming back to the next stage of, of like of building cool demos, after after we got the models, we, we evaluated them on Q1 evals, we got we got some numbers that we were happy about. So then let's share it with, with, with outside audience of, of, of what we've what we've built. And some of you, you may be already familiar. We've launched together, together with GitHub, a product called Copilot, 
which essentially allows anyone who has like who is like uh, approved on a, on, a, on a beta waiting list because it's kind of we 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 we, 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 we are not generally available so there is there, there, there are limits how many people we can serve but like to, to the people who are in the program they, they can use the models in their normal programming workflow to like allow the model to auto complete their code what the model thinks should be there some people find it in some ways useful and so so that was one of our ways of showing what those models can do and how how it can affect potentially like programmers workflow and maybe maybe be helpful in some way another 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 like cool demo we did sometime afterwards was like I, some of you may have watched it i think it's available on youtube right now there's a link on, on, on openai website to that there was a demo presented by greg brockman and Ilya sutskever from openai where they show like the, the capabilities of the models to translate natural language into code and how to how to use that to write a simple javascript game without running any writing any code just just telling the model what to do and then the, using the model to write write code and, and animate a simple game which which I, I i really like all those all those use cases because yeah it's something something new that code models really really enable us to do enable us to like potentially if they will be getting better and better potentially like communicate with, with computers much using much different interfaces and that, that the models will be able without even using specialized api just in any kind of like programming language interpreter it will be able to to do stuff and act on our on our behalf for for what we what we want to do there was there was at the end of that video if anyone is interested there was a a showcase how to use that for example for also like communicating with microsoft word like a lot of software packages have some kind of like a macro language microsoft word has as well and the model was used to write those those like uh, macros for microsoft word to do some work that otherwise we'd have to do by hand because it's not a, not, not an interface people use very often not a particularly approachable interface so as a, as, as, as a last stage there, there there was an analysis of a larger scale like impacts what, what does it mean we got those models we know what they we, we, we know their performance in human evals we showed them to outside people people started started using them and then like figuring out whether whether those models are useful to them in any way or not so like what are what, 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 what are the problems of those models as we as, 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 as we see them there, there is certainly a, a sharp edge for like replay replaying the training set directly if, 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 if the model is prompted right away we did even even before like releasing any products we did like some analysis on that like how often does the model uh, like literally sample the code that was in the training set which as, as you know the code is like a potentially uh, the, the code is like a open source code available from everyone but not everyone is happy if like if their, their their piece of code is directly used in another another project you can what you can do with open source code you can like read it you can like modify it for preserving the, the the original license and all the all the acknowledgements but you cannot just copy and paste open source code into your product this is this is this is uh, for for most of the licenses so this there, there there's a sharp note there so so like there's a question like how often do these models do come up with something that is reasonably novel and different from what they were, what they were trained on versus literally like repeating what they were what what what's, what happened in a training set and like our analysis didn't show that it happens very often like here out of like 400,000 like example interactions it happened like around 42 times but still it means it does happen and when, when it does happen someone has a, has a right to be rightfully offended and then i'm happy about that fact so this is this is definitely one thing that we are you know, we're actively researching how we can how we can like lift that that, that restriction that problem in the in the next versions of those, those models but this is definitely a valuable research question how to how to not cause not let the model cause potentially any harm or anything that people could be could be unhappy about additional additional analysis uh, links to, to potential security aspects of using that models and like most of the people who've used copilot like 
definitely have noticed that there, there are a lot of moments where we write particularly simple code and then and, and it may get somewhat repetitive. And that moment compiled really shines because it's it, it very easily writes for you quicker than you would be able to. Very easy part. And then the moment where you got into a harder part of the program, even when compiled spits out something, it's you know debugging that code and reading through that code and understanding if it is actually correct or not very often get is as much work as writing this code yourself so in in, in some way it's like you you know it's it, it may lead to either people like using copilot to write some code and then not checking it because they think it's, it's an extra work they, they don't want to do which which is very risky because they thought may, the code may simply be wrong the model is not that good yet or or or, or, or the model stops being valuable if it's like the, the person spends a lot of time debugging and figuring it out if the, if the code is correct and uh, the, 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 there are usual misalignment problems that, that you know that, that the models are you know like garbage in garbage out some kind of thing so if you if you if your if your prompt is good if your, if your code is good the model tries best and, and responds correctly to that prompt but if your code is bad if your if your, if your code is already great from the start if your code is like con con contains insecurities because of how the how the training set will apply the, the model will kind of re repeat that style and, and, and replay it, which is not, not what we always want, like especially for like novice programmers. We kind of would like the model to like hold them by hand and like pr present better code that then they would write themselves, because certainly the model is capable to do that. The, the kind of the question is how do we how do we get to that? And there's another another open question. The other the other kind of analysis is that for potential misuse. If like it could lead to new types of malware, for example, some kind of malware that could more easily transform itself. We have, we have found the model to be very successful in like, for example, translating between programming languages. And like, you know, if, if, there, if you have a malware that kind of can rewrite itself from Python to JavaScript to C++ very quickly, or like rephrase part of itself, that could potentially be not something we want, but something that is Definitely, the models in some way uh, enable. Mm -hmm. So, like, out of all that, what we what we've looked at and what we thought about, how do we, what, what does it mean for 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 the future? What does it mean from now until until the next year or until the next five years? So, uh, like. You know the, the 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 language models that write code. You know they are they are limited. They are not superhuman. They they they, they have some things they are good at, but they are they are not solving everything we throw at them straight away. But what they what they kind of like what I consider them is I think they are they are interestingly useful. They are they already are cross sunbar where 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 the promise that they show is, is it has already like some value that is that is like slightly higher than zero. And there is, we, 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 we still need to spend some time thinking how to use them the most productively and uh, in the most, in, in, in the best way for us. But they, 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 they already, to me, like cross some bar of something that is purely research experiment and something that goes on the shelf and we move on to the next thing. But there's something that we, that we kind of can, can continue working with and learning how to, how to leverage as, a, as, a, as an additional tool in our in our toolbox but like as the as the general like large scale trend about ai research about machine learning research is that we we, we all seen the scaling laws we, we 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 see how they how they work and you know the, 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 those curves aren't aren't topping off the, the curves like finished where we where we are able to train largest models so far and it's not that if we if we train a larger model it wouldn't be better it, it will be better so we all know that with adding more parameters more training time compute more more data set size the models will be only getting better and better from where we are so like we kind of like it is in some way inevitable even if open ai stop training today code models someone else would and uh, the GPUs will get cheaper over time. We will all we'll get better ones of those. There will be lots more code on the internet. So, like the, the genie is kind of out of the bottle in, in, in that way. So there is we, we have to be aware that that uh, unless there is like some some tragic event that threatens humanity and moves us like to the the pre-industrial era. 
the, 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 the model, language models that write code are, I think, about to stay and are, are about to only, only get better with time. And because, because kind of like this, this, this research area is still pretty young and it's not something that, that, is, that is in any way done, but more like something what we, what we started exploring, probably there are, there are still some, some even research like low hanging fruits that we could use to make those models better and, and more useful or anything, anything about that. Uh, yeah, so like uh, there is there, there is a prediction of me and it's personal. It's it's purely purely myself, just 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 trying to share with you what what I think about language models that write code, and like after after like publishing those the, the, the results, like compiled a lot of my friends reached out to me, like will 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 programmers be replaced or is it our, our our job on the line? I don't think it will be the case. Like, you know, really automating programmers requires a true general intelligence, which we don't know how far are we and we don't know like where, where is it from. But there are there are certainly some goalposts of intelligence, right? There, 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 there was a certain moment, I think it was 97, when computers started better being at chess than humans. And and, and that before that, for, for some time we were considering playing chess ever like activity like intelligence. After that, we realized, oh, computers can do it. It's no longer intelligence playing chess is easy. 20 years ago, a computer suddenly can play better Go than humans. And again, for a long time, we're thinking, okay, chess, chess is not intelligence, but maybe Go is intelligence. But now, now computers can play Go better than humans, then Go, Go is not intelligence. I don't think computers will be able to program everything like gather requirements, architecture systems as, as good as humans. But they will slowly, slowly start eating a pie of what, of, of a subset of what, what humans do. And in, in, in some ways, I'm thinking at least like some parts of programming, maybe more like chess than, than like, I don't know, writing jokes or, or, or poetry. So like what would I kind of think those models could become? It's more like Mm, like a discovery of excavator, kind of like for a long time, people were like shoveling the dirt and since, you know, digging holes in the ground is a very valuable economic activity that people needed for a long time. For a long time, they used, they used shovels for that and they were, they were digging holes in the ground with, with shovels. At some point, people realized, okay, we can build an excavator and an excavator can like dig much more mud in the, in the same amount of time. So we can big, dig bigger holes and we can dig, build bigger buildings and whatnot. Like the, the, the amount of stuff people could do with digging holes greatly, greatly improved with, with, with invention of the, of the excavator. And I kind of think that, that you know, there, there's a lot of software to be written in the world. And you know, it, it will probably take us a while to get there before, before those models will really, really transform the productivity in programming. But I think it's it's very likely that they do, and that the programmers using some kind of like a neural models for for helping them write software will be will be a meaningful meaningful productivity increase in in, in within like five to ten years from from where we are today. Thank you very much for for listening to me. Uh, this is the time for for questions or whatever you want. Yeah. About. Great, uh, fantastic, fantastic, Jerry. It was very inspiring. So we have some questions. The first question from Jakub: Does the way the doc string is written impact the accuracy by a large factor? Uh, so it was question asked uh, already eighteen minutes ago. So uh, I think that it was a couple of slides earlier. Yes, but I can, I can no problem come back to that slide. Uh... So there, there are definitely, definitely easier and harder way. I haven't seen like that much variability in like if you if you're not trying to be adversarial, if you just if, if you just move things around a little bit, then I don't think things change completely. But if you try to be adversarial and like phrase things in a tricky way, certainly that will that will affect the models the models pretty strongly. So I think this. I think this in, in, in that way models behave rather rather much well. Okay. All right. Uh, I hope it answers Jakub's question. 
And uh, the question from Bajay, what would be the path towards, towards having a reinforcement learning coding agent? So for example, it would get an answer for the test and like not passing the unit test and it would try to give another answer. Yeah, so I, th I think that's basically that's basically what was what was said. But the, mm -hmm. the only thing that is that is missing is like some kind of feedback, right? So there there is an important question if we have an, a, a reinforcement learning for agent that, for example, tries to solve some kind of programming puzzles. We have we we, we have a reward signal because yeah they they they, they unit tests are there, but is there is there any feedback we can we can provide to the model, right? The model the model the model writes some code. And, and 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 like depending on how do you want to how do you want to structure that environment probably running that code should be should be involved in some way for for, for the model to get feedback we don't want to leak the take the unit tests fully uh, to the model but like some some programming like competition programming competitions include some some unit tests as public and you can run them as as at least like figuring out as a small subset of your test, how good it is, and then and then out of that you can you can look into you you, you you can yourself approximate how good that it will be on a hidden set of unit tests. Maybe a model could write unit tests by itself. Maybe like you know in 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 Kaggle competitions there is like public leaderboard and hidden leaderboard. A lot of a lot of things like that could could be there. Hey, great. Uh, and one more question. Uh, so uh, maybe at first I will ask a follow-up question from Wajay. Do you think such a reinforcement learning approach would have a big impact on the model performance? I think it's a, it's a very, very open question, right? So uh, there, 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 there are a lot of people trying to use reinforcement learning with large, large language models. And, you know, like, there are there are the folly efforts to make that better and better. There, 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 there is also some fact that we see that you know the, the, the pre-training kind of depending whether people call it supervised learning or, or unsupervised learning, we still provide the data and to make the model fit to the given data. So reinforcement learning is, is, is very different because it's online part where the model trains from its own its own output. So there, there, there is an open question how, how successful and how, how good we put that model. Like many people hypothesize that it's very important to like go to the next stage of models much better than what we can do now. But I haven't seen up to this date yet any, any system like that that is, that is like very successful. There, 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 there were some like tries also with, with like some aspects that are not code, but like, like human, human preferences, like, OpenAI has, has done some work on like summarization, for example, of stories, and the, 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 they, were, they were doing reinforcement learning versus like learned reward model, and they have shown they have shown some gains some gains from that. But there, I, I, I think like the whole the whole like research question of how we can do reinforcement learning successfully on big language models, I don't think it's, it's solved. I think it's, it's it's an area of research that we will maybe maybe in the next year, maybe in the next five years, we will know more than we will than, than we know, know now. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, another question from Alexander. In the context of scaling loss and contamination, you mentioned that you wrote the testing code yourself. Uh, nonetheless, some researchers propose that contamination can also be present on n-gram level versus whole function level. Uh, this could potentially impact model eval scores. What are your thoughts on this? Well, so, so like our our eval set was like written, uh, you know, written like without without like seeing and referring to any any open source code except for like maybe the code that we had in our in our heads. So like if like there is any part of that that was like kind of accidentally in, 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 in some n-gram uh, correlated with something that is on GitHub, I kind of consider that to be to be a fair game because this is, this is like uh, enough out of distribution that is kind of like should be the same distribution if you start a new project in your editor right now, uh, write some write, write some starter code and ask Copilot for you to. Uh, and ask Copilot for you to come to like to, to complete that. It should kind of have the same performance and the same accuracy as as on those problems that get written. So in that way, I think like you know if there if there is any 
any correlation it is a naturally correlate naturally existing correlation between any any like out of distribution new, new data set you write and existing code that is out there because like you know every every code like already already includes something that someone has written every code has a for loop every code has you know something that 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 that, that, that resembles some code that was already existing at some point mm -hmm. Okay, and probably the last question for today. I would expect that at some level of difficulty of problem to solve, uh, the current model architecture reaches plateau, even with more parameters and input data. Can you comment some more about uh, further research directions to extend the model, adapt its architecture to make it even better, so that in the future, models will replace software engineers in some tasks? Yes, yes. The, 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 the finally, like you know, it, it, it is very interesting way because like we, we kind of intuitively think there, there 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 has to be some some plateau in the moment where the where the models reach the limit. But I, I I kind of think of it slightly differently as if you look at the at the scaling laws, they aren't necessarily super steep. Uh, so I, I I I think it's more of a more of a like a cost of further improvement because like you know, on the on the on the x axis we see it's basically a logarithm of model size on y axis it's like the percentage of the, of, the, of the performance of the model so i don't think it's necessarily like the model may, may reach literally a ceiling and it cannot break through it's just with, with the current paradigm and with the current methods uh, just just scaling to to get consequently further and further improvements without doing anything is getting consequently more and more expensive at some point it's like you know it's, it will be more and more dollars and there are atoms and atoms in the universe or something like that so i, I, I think it's more, more more like the the, the steepness of a scaling law is, is in some way the tyrant as well of the performance that that, that, that we have and like a lot of the, the research effort is like, how can we create methods that increase the steepness of those scaling laws? How can we make how can we make models that 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 like you know even even if they if they don't increase that that much and like a, in like a low compute regime, if we start increasing the model, it would, they would they will start improving much more, more much more quickly because no one thinks that the model with ten parameters will be an excellent will be an excellent programmer. So like definitely, definitely like anything that we can do that can increase the steepness of a scaling law is is is, is, a, is at the center of that, and like you know there, there there are many ideas. It's like it's very hard to say in hindsight which ideas will be successful or not. Like the, the magic of research is that you you try a lot of things. You are you are you think each one of them will work, but at the end only one of them works. This is. And uh, this, this is kind of at least my my experience with doing research. So it's 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 hard for me to say like what what is the right way, but I'm kind of like I think like one very fundamental problem with our models like one, one, one thing could be like doing reinforcement learning like 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 just just someone asked before reinforcement learning is a very potentially fruitful and interesting research direction. The other one is like the, the amount of compute that we spend for a particular token as, as a current transformers, they're very fixed in where, where, where the model is doing thinking. The model is doing like very fixed amount of thinking for every token it generates. Actually, we're, when, when writing a program, we'd like to first think a long time before writing a program and then, then just write it. And if, after you already write the first word of the program, this, 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 this word like Probably determines a lot of a lot of stuff you can do, and the model kind of can't come back from that. So like maybe maybe like no, it's it's very hypothetical, but maybe some methods that will allow that model to allocate the, the compute it spends thinking on writing the, the the solution would could could very much like change the way the, the way the scaling and model performance works. These are these are just just some ideas, but there are there are, there's probably a lot of them. Some of them are, are more, some of them are less speculative. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Very interesting discussion. Uh, so thanks for this. And uh, yeah, I think we can uh, finish for today. So I will just share with you um, the feedback form. Yes, I just shared it on our chat. So feel free to fill it in and uh, give us a, your feedback. Also, there is a question about uh, 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 the question on how to organize uh, the next uh, Warsaw AI event. So whether you prefer it to be 
an online event or uh, on-site or a hybrid event. So of course, uh, it's still possible that it will not be dependent only on, on us, but uh, anyway, we would, be, we, are, we would like to hear your opinion as well. And let me just share uh, some final slides before we finish. Uh, okay. okay, so yeah, thanks for your attention, first of all, and also uh, we'd like to thank our great speakers. Um, if you are interested in a future Warsaw AI uh, meetups, uh, please follow us uh, on Facebook uh, or follow our YouTube channel. Uh, this event is recorded, so um, the video will be soon available on, on YouTube. You can also join our Google groups. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, uh, feel free to give us your feedback. Uh, what's your preferred form of organizing uh, the next uh, episode? So in fact, it will be episode 14 uh, and uh, we'll make the decision uh, also soon and announce it uh, later on. Uh, our social media and Google groups. Um, so I think we can we can finish for today. So I will now stop uh, recording.